Hi, I'm Nancy Howell. I'm on the board of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and I have the honor this afternoon of uh, interviewing Dr. Stephen Kress. Dr. Kress, as you may know, has done a wonderful job of restoring seabirds, puffins, common terns, along the east coast of the U.S. Uh, Dr. Kress is the vice president of bird, for bird conservation for National Audubon Society and the director of the Seabird Restoration Program and Hog Island Camp. Wow, does a lot. Um, so Dr. Kress, how did you get yourself interested in puffins and the seabirds that, are, um, that were endangered at one point? Well, you know, Maine was always a kind of a destination that I wanted to go to even when I was a little kid growing up here in Ohio. I'm from Columbus originally, so coming up to uh, Maine was, was always a gold mine. And when I was offered an opportunity to teach at the Audubon camp on Hog Island back about 1969, I jumped at that chance and uh, I've been associated with that special place ever since. Uh, so. Once I was a bird life instructor there, I began realizing that the birds we were seeing in the late 1960s weren't the kinds of birds that used to breed there according to the, all the historic records. The his, history tells us that the, the islands off the coast of Maine were once nesting places for puffins and several species of terns, razorbills, all these sort of uh, northern birds that reached their southern limit on the Maine coast. But, they had disappeared because of excessive hunting for food and for feathers, especially in the late 1800s. Wow. And the, all that you've learned about um, getting puffins to nest, turns to nest with by bringing birds in, uh, the young birds in, and uh, fostering them, I guess that's what you call it. Um, has this helped other species in other parts of the world? Have you worked with other uh, organizations in returning mm -hmm. seabirds or other birds? So, <coughs> so in order to <coughs> excuse me. So, in order to bring the puffins back to Maine, we had to invent methods uh, because this uh, hadn't been done previously, and those methods, like translocation of, of chicks. Uh, and attraction of birds using decoys and audio recordings, those were novel methods at the time. But now those methods are uh, basic tools for, uh, for seabird uh, conservation, especially people who are eager to try to restore historic colonies of birds. And historical colonies may mean a, a bird population that was decimated by an oil spill or one that's being flooded by ocean level rise. Um, so there's, there's many applications now uh, for the methods that we developed, but in Maine it was trying to make up for the, the intensive hunting that happened a hundred years ago, the hunting that caused puffins that to decline to just one pair by 1901. Wow. So we had to sort of start from the beginning, develop these methods, but they, they are now becoming uh, basic tools for seabird conservation. I know of at least uh, 50 species of seabirds that have benefited from these same methods that were pioneered in wow. Maine. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That's wonderful, as a matter of fact. Um, I guess the next question, I, you know, I have a, a friend, a colleague, who has moved to Hawaii. And have you done anything with like Hawaii, some of the Hawaiian petrels and some of the species that are really critically endangered on an island like mm. Hawaii? So one of my graduate students, uh, Richard Podolsky, got his PhD um, learning how to attract laysan albatross using decoys. And he experimented with two-dimensional and three-dimensional decoys and, and audio recordings. And his work actually seeded the, the, uh, the new colony on uh, Kauai at Kilauea Point. Wow. So people that go to Hawaii now can see um, albatross nesting there. And from there, they've spread out to other places on other islands. But the... Um, the methods are being now used for uh, for uh, Hawaiian uh, petrels as well, and for the Newell's Manx shearwater. Um, and it's all always some little twist, either it's translocation of chicks or it's attraction using audio recordings, um, occasionally using scent as well, um, sometimes using mirrors, reflective 
mirrors on special little mirror boxes. So we we're proud of the fact that we developed these these things. And just this year, an interesting thing happened. A, a company that had uh, developed a, a whole line of conservation decoys, uh, specialized uh, seabird decoys, a very niche industry, um, and was shipping these all over the world. They they family it was a family a business. They retired and they donated their. Um, company to Audubon, so we're now making the conservation decoys also, and just since uh, January we've shipped these out to five countries and about six different states. That's amazing! Yeah. Wow. So, so, so we're, we're, we just want to make sure that people have the tools they they need to, to do this work, and at least uh, I think we made ten sound boxes since January projects all over the, the U.S. Because audio recordings, it turns out are one of the great tools for attracting seabirds. They, they don't like to nest by themselves. They want to nest in places where they see others. That's where the decoys come in. And where they hear the sounds of other seabirds. That's where the audio boxes come in. Hmm. Wow. And do many seabirds have a sense of smell? Uh, probably uh, most birds have a sense of smell. Mm -hmm. For a long time, it was thought that birds really didn't have a sense of smell. There's more work now showing that they do. But seabirds especially, uh, the petrels are famous for this. Mm, they are. They have such keen smell, they can pick up the smell of plankton at sea, but they can also, patches of plankton, uh, they can also pick up um, the smell of their nesting island. Uh, even though they live in a very windy place and <coughs> that smell is being broadcast, uh, they can pick up the smell, they can follow the, the smell, sort of like a salmon returning wow. to its river. They can follow this this aerial river of, of petrol scent, not just to their home island, but to their actual nesting burrow, because their burrow smells different than all the other burrows, and they may live in, in colonies of hundreds of thousands. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, uh, who would have thought, uh, yeah. you know, because we always hear that birds, eh, their sense of smell isn't so great. Mm. What does a puffin feel like? What does a puffin feel like? Well, <laughs> I mean, how big are they? I'm, puffins I'm, are about 10 inches tall. Atlantic puffins, uh, they're 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 yeah they're about that big, uh -huh. not not that big, but um, pu the feel of a puffin you know, or any seabird in the hand, an adult, is one of just sheer muscle. Wow. They are very powerful birds, and if you think about it, I mean it's all you can do to hold their wings in, oh. because uh, when they're underwater, they're using their wings to to dive, so they're essentially flying underwater. And so to, to, that suggests right there they must have powerful breast muscles, not just to stroke the air but which they can fly, but stroke the water. And so they use these to dive to 100 feet or more. So if you have the, the rare opportunity to hold one, you know, it's, it's a, it's a massive, massive muscular bird, even though it's 10 inches tall. The other thing about it is that, is that even though they look cute and cuddly, um, if you stick your, your hand in a puffin's burrow, you're reminded that it's not so cute and cuddly because that sharp tipped beak can grab you and, and once they grab you they just shake their head. I was that was the next thing I <laughs> Hang was on. Gonna, I was the next thing I was gonna ask. Have you ever been bitten yes. pinched by one? Oh yeah. yes, we love it. Yeah. We love to get pinched by puffins. <laughs> and sharp and they have sharp toes nails too, because they use their toes to dig holes into the ground. They can nest eight feet underground and, and they return to the same burrow year after year, which is quite an investment to dig a deep hole like that. But they come back and the hole goes straight in and it twists to one direction or another. So there's a little dark a nesting chamber at the very end of it. But that's, uh, to, to ban them, you take your, your longest armed intern and you have them reach into a hole. Uh, one or two ticks in a, in a burrow. Uh, they only have one egg, one. Uh, and they lay that one egg when they are about five years old at the earliest, maybe not till seven. They may live to be 35 years old. Um, and then they both parents incubate the egg, and it takes about six weeks with twice the length of a chicken egg to hatch, and another six weeks to uh, rear the chicks, or three months underground. 
what are some of the dangers that the seabirds are facing now? You mentioned hunting early on. I know there is still some hunting in other countries, some take, but what are some of the dangers that, that many seabirds are facing at this point? Um, so puffins were hunted, but they're now protected, fortunately. They're protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, but the problems puffins face today are much more difficult to control than the problems of the 1800s. We passed some laws, we hired a few wardens, and fixed that problem. Today's problems are much uh, greater because they, they relate to the puffins' marine habitat. It turns out the puffins are excellent indicators of the health of the oceans, so if something's going wrong out there, uh, or changing, uh, they're not going to be able to uh, adapt uh, right away. So, so climate change is the, is the biggest problem for all birds today, not just the puffins. But, but we often think about it in context of land birds, and people don't always think about the, the seabirds as being affected, but they are. We, we've seen it. The Gulf of Maine, for example, is warming up faster than any other body of marine water in the world, uh, and it is um, affecting everything from the plankton on up to the big fish. The kinds of plankton are changing, they're not as nutritious, um, and the small fish are moving in different places, uh, they're going to where they can find food, the little fish do, and those places aren't always where the puffin nesting islands are. So some islands are are doing okay still, other islands are not. And this is, this is uh, uh, an indirect result of, of climate change. Wow. How about uh, fishing, overfishing, harvesting? So, uh, so that's that, the other, that that's another? overfishing is always a challenge for, um, for fish because the technology is so efficient. Sea, uh, the, the forage fish we, we call seabirds feeding on, they tend to live in schools often big balls of, of fish and they find protection by living in these big balls but that makes those those schools very vulnerable to uh, high-tech fishing fleets that have sonar and have spotting planes and they can spot these and then fishing boats and mobile fishing gear can go out and capture these whole balls of fish and, and um, so that is actually um, an opportunity because that's a policy management thing and that's something that can be affected by conservation uh, more directly even than the than climate change. So right now a lot of what we're focusing on our work is policy for uh, protecting the forage fish so that there's enough fish left in the sea for seabirds and for whales and, and seals and turtles and, and, uh, and big fish. So I guess it's, we can say it, it's a global concern with national and international waters, the climate change. Um, you know, we, we don't often think about these things, but uh, it's small things like the plankton, uh, the changing climate, the forage fish, all up the food chain um, that, that, you know, really we, we sometimes just don't think about. Well, they're, they're, they're not, in, not in our vision. But just today it made the news that the uh, worm populations of Maine had dropped off by about half. Wow. The marine worms that wow. live in the sand and that became an issue for, for people who have gone out and harvested those worms for fishing. Mm -hmm. So fishers are upset because they can't get worms, but what's, what's causing that? That could well be a climate effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I'm hoping that we'll have a positive note, and I'm sure you're. Well, there is positive news, yes. and, and I'm going to get sure. Like I'm going to share a short story right now, uh, but I'll talk more about it tonight. And that is is about the fisheries. Uh, there has been some responsible fisheries management going on since the 1970s, and uh, with the Magnuson Fisheries Conservation Act, and there are at least two species of fish that are recovering and have had the t opportunity to recover. The uh, haddock and the Acadian redfish, both were way overfished. Acadian redfish was actually on the endangered species list. It's recovered to the point that there can be a modest fishery again on it, and the puffins have found it. And 
that's one of the fish, the new fish, that they're coming back and feeding their chicks now. So this, is, this answers your question that, yes, uh, fisheries are a problem, but fisheries can also be an opportunity because if the fisheries is well managed, then there's food for both the fishermen to catch and for us to eat and for the puffins to eat. Sure. It's all about knowing how much fish to catch. Wonderful. Wow. Yay. I always like to end things on a positive note. Yeah. And I really appreciate the time that you've taken in this short interview, but very informative interview. So we really look forward to hearing much more about seabird protection and, and all your hard work. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much.